Hey everybody, Liam Clisham here for another Redshift tutorial. This time we're hopping inside of Houdini and taking a look at how to render strands on NURBS and Bezier objects. Coming from a Cinema 4D background and the videos that I've made for splines inside of Cinema 4D, I thought it was going to be really easy, but there's a few gotchas that I think everyone should know about, especially when you can't find those gotchas inside the manual. So I really hope this video helps you guys out. So with that said, let's jump into it. So now that we're inside Houdini, I just want to break down my scene a little bit and tell you what's going on and talk about some of the gotchas that happen inside of Houdini as well, especially for working with nerbs and strands. So first off, this scene is set up with the circle nerves and a line coming off and then these grids or squares being copied to the end of these lines here. And if you've been learning Houdini for any period of time, you might recognize this as one of Rowan Dalvey's tutorials or courses. And he was my go-to when I started learning Houdini. So if you want to learn more about what I've got going on here, go check out his work. Um, this is one of those scenes, and I really wanted to learn how to take it from Mantra and bring it into Redshift and see the speed difference and really what inspired this tutorial. So props to Rowan. Um, so what, what happens inside of Houdini and Redshift is a little bit different than if you've watched my Cinema 4D tutorials. In Cinema 4D, you can very easily just add a Redshift tag to a spline, and it will pretty much do what you're expecting it to do in the render view or when you're sending out the final render. Inside of Houdini, it's a little different. Um, it's partly Redshift, but also partly Houdini and making sure you have all your parameters in place. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this is rendering now. If you don't already have it open, just go ahead and add your Redshift Redshift shelf, excuse me, and then click on Render View. So we'll pop this open. Might take a second. OBS is eating a lot more resources than normal, so it's been a little bit delayed with getting Redshift to pop up in Houdini. Give it one more second. All right, I'm going to hit it again. There we go. All right, so you can see in here, I just have my grid or my squares showing up. And that's just because these are normal geometry. There aren't any nerves or splines inside here. It's just these grids being copied. So for this, to get started, what you're gonna need to do is get this Redshift Object tab activated. So you select your geometry, and then go up to your shelf and then hit OBJ plus or Object plus, and it'll add your Redshift object parameters to your geometry. Then you get settings. This is how you're going to add like an object ID or crypto mat, um, work with some proxies or different visibility settings. So there's a lot that's in here. We're just going to focus on strands at the moment. So as soon as I check this, I'm going to do a quick reload. You'll see that we get our lines in here and that circle in here. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in and turn a little bit. So you'll see that I've got these strands and they're not facing the same way uh, all across. So these lines are turned and facing like the X and Z while the circle and these grid squares are facing up on the Y. So that's one of the first gotchas that I found in Houdini and Redshift is you really have to make sure you have normals on your splines or your nerves or your Bezier curves, whatever you want to call them. I'm probably going to keep calling them splines because that's how I originally learned it in Cinema 4D, but know that I'm talking about nerves or Bezier curves. So if we go inside here, I've got these turned off right now. I'm going to go ahead and pause this and then turn these on. These are just normals, so the way you can add them is by adding a point node, coming here, selecting normal, and I've set mine to Y, and that should clear up everything and put it in the direction I want. So go ahead, hit render again, and you'll see everything's facing the same way. So just be really aware of that, that if you are rendering something and it's not facing the way that you expect, you probably need to add in some normals, especially if you're using strip. While talking about strip, let's also see what we have for strand types. You've got a box, cylinder, capsule, cone, and then strip. So strip should be your default when you show up or when it shows up. 
that's what I want to use for this. I just want it nice and thin. However, if you do want some depth to it, cylinder will work just as well. Turn that on and you'll see that we start getting cylinders. I'm going to go ahead and set it back to strip, hit reload, and get going with the other stuff. All right, so gotcha number two. And I've tried to find this in the Redshift manual to be better able to explain it to you guys. The max tessellation subdivisions here don't do exactly what you would expect. And frankly, I'm not really sure what they're doing. And I need to explore a little bit more because it's not in the manual. So right now, from far away, it seems like these circles look really good and are pretty much perfectly rendered. However, if you have a scene that you need to get in really close, you can see over in this area, it's not quite perfect. So this is the next gotcha, is that while you think you might be adding subdivisions in here and making your NURBS or Bezier more accurate and being subdivided, it's not really doing anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause this and then bring this down to like four and hit play. And you'll see it hasn't done anything. So you need to be cognizant and make sure that you're doing all your adjustments and divisions inside your actual curves under divisions. So just be really aware of that. If, it, if you need to get a close up of something and you want that perfect circle, you're probably gonna need to add more divisions. All right, next kinda gotcha, but also cool feature of working with strands is you can have a default scale here but you can also use P scale attributes. So let me go ahead and hit render again. For this, I'm actually using a P scale. So we'll go back in here and right here in this attribute create, I've got a P scale value of 005 or 0 0.005, excuse me. And that is overriding this default scale here. So if I bump this up to one and restart the render, it doesn't do anything. And let's put that back at zero one. But if I do ignore the P scale attribute, hit render again, you'll see this got a lot thicker. And now I can control things right in here. Probably have to hit reload again. And now it's starting to all blob together. But that's really handy. So you can start setting up your attributes at a geometry level and going in and using p-scale or you can control it all right here so that's really handy there's also a scale multiplier here and that doesn't get overridden um, it will multiply whatever is active so if you're using p-scale it will scale that if you're using the default scale then it will multiply against that so if I uncheck this hit reload or back to what I was at let's say 1.25 do a quick reload, you'll see it got thicker there too. So really handy stuff right there. The next thing, and this kind of goes back to with the tessellation uh, stuff I was talking about before, is screen space adaptive tessellation. I've noticed that if you uncheck this, it can make your subdivisions a little bit more obvious. Um, I've, I've got mine so high now at 36 that I don't think you're gonna notice here, but let me just go ahead and do a quick reload and see if that does anything. Yes, yeah, so you can't really tell. Like, I can see that part of the line right here is sticking out just a little bit. It's not like 100% as perfect as I had it before. Not that it was perfect, but not as close. Um, so, what screen space adaptive tessellation is doing is the closer you get to an object, it's going to try and add more tessellation. The further you are away, it'll know, well, you're further away, so you don't need as much detail, so you sh shouldn't need as much tessellation. Again, there's not much in the manual about this, and from what I've been playing with it, it, it does seem to do something with the subdividing, but it's not acting the way that it should. So as soon as the manual gets updated on the Redshift site, I'll come back in here and update you guys as well. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that back on, hit reload, and zoom back out. All right, so final gotcha. You need to be aware of what the strands are affecting. And what I mean by that is that once you turn this on, it's going to affect everything 
in that geometry node. So if I come in here, you could probably think, well, you've got all your objects in here and you're copying your crosshairs, why not copy your grid squares onto the crosshairs at this level? And that's because if I come back up here and I turn on strands here and do a quick reload, you'll see it would be adding strands and killing the geometry and making all my squares look like this. And that's not what I want. I really want those gridded squares. So I had to pull that geometry out into its own geometry node. So that's something to be aware of, is as you're building things, you might be used to keeping things all in one node and having things run together and connecting copy sops to other copy sops and, and all that. You might have to start breaking down your geometry into a little bit simpler things to get the look that you want. Um, and that goes with particles and volumes and things too. So if you have particles in here, you need to be aware of how this would affect everything inside that node, or if you had a volume in there and you're turning on your velocity and stuff, just be aware that you're really acting, activating this for the entire geometry node and everything that's inside there. So to get the exact look that you want, you may have to break stuff out, um, which is a little bit different than working inside Mantra when you can usually stay with inside one geometry node and get stuff to work as you want. So that's it for this tutorial. If you guys like having Houdini Redshift tutorials, let me know and I'll start making more of them. Most of the stuff that I've made in Cinema 4D does carry over inside of Houdini. But as I showed in this video, there are gotchas with certain things, just like with strands. So if you're looking for more information on Houdini and Redshift, let me know in the comments below and I'll start making some more tutorials for Houdini and Redshift as well. If you ever have questions, comments below are always great. You can reach out to me anywhere. You can find me as 531 or go to my website and shoot me an email. Also, I really want to start doing Redshift Thursdays again, so be on the lookout for those. They should be starting up pretty soon as we roll into March here. All right, guys, thanks so much as always, and I'll talk to you soon.